Podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to episode 46 of The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors with Bob Cook and myself, Jackie Jones. And in this episode, we're going to be talking about, um, I've got a frog, <clears throat> the client who doesn't know why they are there or what they want from therapy. Yes, you know, I'm smiling. Uh, well, not the not your your cough or anything. Um, I was, I was smiling at the number of clients who, in my clinical history, have said, "Well, actually, I don't know why I'm here. I just feel I had to come because the discomfort in my life had been so high." Or they might say, "Well, I don't know why I'm here. I don't actually." uh no I think there's anything wrong with me perhaps but i'm here uh, and we can have a range of transactions like that it makes me smile because uh more often than not um it's a it's a minimizing transaction it's a it shows often denial and those people often stay with me the longest <laughs> yeah i can see that <clears throat> Again, I know we've spoke about it in the past, but in this country, in the UK, in order to be trained in transactional analysis, you have to have your own personal therapy throughout your yeah. training. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yes, I know where you're going. I didn't think there was anything wrong with me until I started training, and then suddenly it was like, oh, my God. <laughs> Not your cough or your... <laughs> <clears throat> Literally, it was like... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I thought I was, you know, functioning quite well until I started therapy, and then slowly but surely things started coming up for me so I would probably have been one of those people yeah it's interesting what you just said that to be a psychotherapist you have to have your own therapy you have if you're <laughs> in the UKCP training at the institute you have to do 40 hours a year you know uh, 160 hours in the whole training and I'm sure what you've just described many of the trainee psychotherapists have probably said to their therapist well you know i've got to do it because i have to do it because otherwise i can't be a psychotherapist but actually there's nothing wrong with me i don't know what we're going to talk about with for four years what do you think yeah you know. or interestingly <laughs> i think there's the other group of people who maybe i know in in the last podcast we were talking about you know the avoidant client that yeah. maybe start training as a psychotherapist because they know that therapy is part of it and it kind of I don't know there's no shame or that first connection with yeah. a therapist is done because they're doing their training and you it, get a that... lot of people no you're right you get a lot of people come to therapy and they they may not say that what you you've just said but ostensibly it works out that way yeah yeah so what do we do with a client that comes and they don't know why they're there? Or what oh, you would get back to the, <laughs> no, not the psychotherapy trains, you know, the clinical world where you go. You often, well, it's split into categories again, I think. Um, you get people who have been sent there. Yes. And they said, oh, you know, my partner sent me or, you know, uh, my friends have said that I'm a real pain or I actually don't think it's much wrong with me, but I, I, I'm, go, I, I'm here anyway. Now, Therapist with that type has ha, type of person has a or those types of transactions needs to start needs to think. Well, what about motivation? You know, yeah. in other words, are you do you actually want to be here for yourself as well, or is this simply because you've been told to come? Oh no 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 no! Uh, I want to be here for myself. Um, yeah. Oh yes 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 yes. Or you might get somebody said, well, no, I don't really need to be here. I'm just doing it because of I, I've been sent here. Then I would send those people away. Yeah. I would say, come back when you're coming back for yourself then. Because if they're doing their therapy from an adapted place, which that is, yeah, adapting to please or whatever it is, uh, therapy will never work because you'll never meet the real self. And also... 
they're not taking ownership of, that there's anything wrong. Mm. It's surprising how many telephone calls I get from parents of grown up children or partners that they'll phone me up and ask if I'll see their child or their partner. Mm. And when I say to them, yes, I'm quite happy to see them, but they need to phone me up and make an appointment. I can't make an appointment for somebody yeah. through you. And they're quite shocked as if, really? why not? Really? Yeah. Oh. I haven't had that so much because I don't, don't really get into that discourse, I suppose. But it's, it, 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 it's an interesting one. Well, if if they, I can't remember parents saying that actually. But uh, if they did, I, 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 actually, I'd probably attempt to get the the uh, parent into therapy instead. Which is, <laughs> well, it, it, it's interesting. I've had seriously, I've had quite a few phone calls over whether it's because of the pandemic or yeah. whatever it is that you know they're, they're really struggling. And you know, will you can you help them? And I'm like, yes, I can. So can I make an appointment for them? It's no, you can't make an appointment. They uh -huh. make contact yeah. with me, especially if they're over eighteen. Exactly. Yeah, but they seem quite shocked at that. So not only do people go to therapy because they kind of been told to, but out there in society, people are trying to make appointments for their mm. relatives or friends to actually go to therapy. Yeah. That's an interesting one. The other category of people who come and say, well, I know uh, my life, I'm not happy in my life, the discomfort's so high, and I just, I just need to be here. I don't really know why. Yeah. But I know that I need to be in therapy. Now, when I meet that type of person, um, I'm more likely to say a transaction like this, which I'm going to say to you now. I'll say, well, it sounds like you obviously need to be here as well as want to be here. So if you had to guess what this is all about, what would your guess be? Yeah. It's really powerful, that. Mm. Yeah, because you're not you're not wanting them to commit to something. Just the word, you know, saying, "Well, take a guess." Yeah. It's it's yeah, it's not definite, is it? Not definite, and TA terms is bypassing the parent. Yeah, yeah. And in other words, it's given permission to the younger self to be able to reflect. Yeah. On so then usually what happens in my experience they start guessing or reflecting oh well if you're asking me to reflect i think it might be because i've just been so unhappy you know i've been happy for years and then the next question needs to be and they're queries more than questions i do want to say that, is well, what does happy mean for you because they will start to speak especially with people who don't know why they're there um, well, they'll, they'll start to minimise, they'll speak in vague terms, and they're all deflecting transactions to actually keep you away, actually. Yeah. And the therapist can understand that and see them in those terms as defence coping mechanisms. Then the therapist can then choose to gently just confront those transactions. Now, I don't like being confronted by... <coughs> That's just ridiculous or something. But yeah. confront them in terms of well, that's interesting. So, you know, what do you mean by happy then? What do you mean by unhappy? Oh, um, well, you know, I'm unhappy because I and they'll start to give reasons then. Yeah. I'm unhappy because I can never never stay in a relationship. Oh, because now if you start to go like that very slowly. 10 to 1, you're going to find out why they come to therapy. Yeah. Because there's something about they already know the answer. <laughs> they know. I mean, those yeah. types of people know, but they need somebody to help them gently reflect on a hypothesis yeah. of what it may be about. Yeah. 
And it was about exploration as well and just exploring. It's all about, yeah, yeah. It's all about, and then and use the, uh, you know, you'll get many transactions saying, well, you know, I know I need to be here, but you know, you know, look at all these people who uh, are far worse than me, far worse. Um, actually, I don't think I should be here really. Uh, you get you get a lot of that type of deflection or distraction, and um, I, I I I think I'm very I think I'm very good as a therapist. One of my strengths, which is what what could be called in the game phenomenological inquiry, but another way to look at it is a reflection on their younger self and how that younger self is really sabotaging their um, abilities to get better. Yeah. I when when that kind of thing comes up in therapy, I always say that it's like the child is scared; it doesn't want things to change because this is how it's always worked up to this point. Yeah. So you know, there's 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 going to be a scared child in there somewhere because you're kind of pushing the comfort zone a little bit. You got one thing though, yes, absolutely. You got one aspect that is really important to remember. That they've come to therapy in the first place. Yeah. Now, if they've come to therapy in the first place, and that level of motivation to change, even though they might be part of themselves, like what you've just talked about, scared and everything that goes with that, they've got a bigger part, I think, or at least an equal part. Yeah. That has the energy to change, even if they don't know it. Yeah, hundred percent. Which is a saving grace for all of us, really, because. You know, even though we've got a scared child inside us, you know, that drive to make a change, to live a better life in mm. less suffering is mm. what drives us to make a change and to go to therapy. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. So have you had many clients yourself in your own clinical practice to present not knowing why they're there or don't know what to work on? or Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and we we usually start off with a, a, a four week exploratory contract thing where that that's what we do, and also the ones that say that you know well there's nothing really wrong there's there's people worse off than me I hear that oh. an awful lot from clients yeah yeah the major happened to me I had a happy childhood it, it, all these reasons why they shouldn't be in the therapy room yeah. Oh. Oh. And they're all minimizing and they're all transactions which are aimed at deflecting you from. But the duty of the therapist, I believe, especially with these types of clients, is actually to be, be a bit like a terrier and keep on the case. Yeah. I could <laughs> dog with the ball. <laughs> be like the Sherlock Holmes. Yes. Yeah. Oh. I'm a great believer in in being like a Sherlock Holmes character, a bit like a terrier, just you keep on and on, but gently, and you know, permission transactions, helping them reflect yeah. what's, what's going on in their life, helping them looking at how the past affects the present, looking at the unmet relational needs. They're all the reasons why a client comes in the first place yeah and sometimes with these sorts of clients who you know say that they don't really know why they're there i i think that you know having a, a sense of humor helps as well you know that i don't go in full-on therapy mode with them either it, it's about you know them knowing that it's a safe space to talk about whatever they want to do if they want to come in and just offload they can come in and offload yeah so humor yeah yeah making yeah. things lighter yes mm. and and kind of layer by layer or, or once the therapeutic relationship is built up and they feel more comfortable and like you said they they have the answers they know why so it is just those you know, subtle questions. Yeah. 
Yeah, uh, 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 so, uh, another thing, Jackie, which is I uh, uh, held by dear, dear, by the way, is it's okay for people to not know. Yeah. That and shocks it, uh, them when you say that. It's okay to not know. Yeah, and it's okay to work with the unknown. Yeah. Because a lot of the therapeutic healing, actually, is because people um, have a fear of the unknown. Yeah, of course, the opposite of that, of course, is taking control, working things out, and everything that goes with that. And that, of course, leads to a lot of issues. Yeah, so it's okay for them not to know, but that's different from an attempt to understand them. They are very different. It's okay for them not to know, and and as okay to work with the unknown. And how does that, how does that actually? stop you getting what you want today so it's fine work with the unknown and how does that actually work in you not getting what you want today so it's been like a terrier yeah it's been like permissions and to, to just keep with them because there is, there is another kind of thing that I think about with this where you know people goal setting and moving towards something there are that section of society that know what they don't want mm. that kind of gives them the direction rather than going for something that they do want mm. they find their way by avoiding certain things if that am I explaining it right I don't know the move away from and the move towards people. <laughs> mm. Well, I think you're talking about control and vulnerability. Yeah. To other sides of the polarity, which is actually the same thing in some ways. But I think that, um, you know, it's really, really important to allow space and silence and to give them permission to explore the unknown. Yeah. Well, yeah, but you know, some clients will tell me all the things they don't want. Oh yeah, because they don't know what. If you take nine or ten, if you went to, if I went out of the street, but it's snowing now, so I won't. But if <laughs> I did, and I found nine, found ten people, yeah, just found ten people in Tesco's or somewhere, and I said, I would guarantee you, if I asked them, they would know what they don't want before they know what they want. Yeah. So probably eight of the eight of the ten people would list off what they don't want. Yeah. Before they get to what they want. Yeah. So that's very common. And sometimes that's quite a good tool in the therapy room to have. You yeah. know, if they if they're saying I, I, I don't know I don't know what I want, I, I'll often say to them, "Well, tell me what you don't want." Yeah. And it, it kind of points you in in that direction. Yeah. yeah. Because eventually. Uh, you can only go so far with that. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah Facebook yeah. will stop. Yeah. <laughs> and then you'll say, have you, you know, have you stopped? Is there anything else there that you don't want? And I'll say, well, no, I think I've come. Well, okay, then. Just put that in a compartment then. And, and is it okay if you allow yourself to just go beyond that place to reflect on what might be what you want in this world or have you always been denied the opportunity to explore what you might want yeah which again you know is an important thing if you know we're prevented from mm. that and that again goes into the fantasy and the daydreaming and all that sort of stuff we all fantasize about what we would like yeah but you see i think one of the the relational needs underneath all this is the need for self-definition to be able to define ourselves yeah to have dreams to have aspirations to hope things can be different but if we've had parents or significant others which take ownership of that process and ownership of you then we become defined yes never yeah. believe that we can actually dare to hope we might get what we want because yeah. we've always been told what we should want yeah 
And again, you know, again, for me, that links into creativity as well. Mm. You know, to allow ourselves to be creative and to explore and to aim big about, you know, what we often we put limits on ourselves as to what is achievable or what, you know, I can potentially yeah. have. But we do that because we have an internalized parent mm. which has done it before for you. In other words, their parenting or significant other people have defined them. Yeah. So they never had the opportunity to do what you're talking about. Doesn't mean creativity, creativity, spontaneity, reflection isn't there. No, hundred percent. Parent is so imposing, yeah, overbearing. They've never been able to even allow themselves to imagine, yeah, things you're talking about. Yeah. So what's the first step besides getting to know them and everything else? But you need to help the younger child, but you know, in the end, you have to take that parent on. Yeah. You can give as much permission as if you'd like for self-definition of the child, youngest child in the person, but you, but you also need to help desensitize that parent, that shadow above the person. Yeah. Which is where I see a lot of the limiting beliefs that we have that they, they are capped that it is that critical parent or that parent mm. that is imposing those limits yeah mm. now the parent usually i believe is it comes from a scared place in other words um you know if they don't take ownership if they don't self-define xxx then something's going to happen yeah to themselves or to their child yeah and that's because of their own history of course that's why i said earlier on in one of the podcasts maybe it was this one uh it'd be good if you could if i could get to do therapy with a lot of the parents of the clients that come in the room in the first place yeah now what, what i do of course is do a lot of the work with the parents of the clients but i do it through fantasy role play and psychologically be more powerful than the original parent yeah which is a really interesting thing to do because it's not about blaming and shaming the parents or anything sometimes it's about understanding why as parents we do what we do and again i'm a parent you know and i've got a parent and my upbringing has impacted on me which theoretically i then pass on to my children Oh, and that's where the scare comes in. Yeah. That we'll repeat history with our own children often. Yeah. Even though we all make a choice, we, we all make a choice in this. Well, it's an interesting one. I mean, <laughs> I could talk forever about this. We should do a podcast on it. But, the, you know, when I'm often talking to the parents in the client, or, um, if you like, or role-playing parent, we, we come across a phenomena called Hobson's choice. Mm, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there's a choice and they often feel there's not a choice. Yeah. So um, that's an important thing to think about, I think. Yes. But, but, you know, at one level, there's always choices. But if the choice is damned if you do, damned if you don't. Yeah becomes a very limited choice yes yeah and again survival comes into it <laughs> you know we we do what we do in order to survive our upbringing or whatever it is and in a, a child's place it is often life and death it's very black and white stuff yeah so the clients that come in your room and say i don't really know what i'm here but i, I feel I'm, i've had central unhappiness or discomfort and I just need to be here. All the clients say, I don't really know what I want to work in therapy. I think it's really, really important to think about healing, that they've really come. However they want to frame it, that somebody might help them in healing. To, to have a, just to have, even if it's only for a moment, an enhanced positive experience in life yeah 
or somebody or somebody who might just spend a few moments trying to help them understand themselves or help them look at themselves or understand how come they've been the way they are. Somebody yeah. would just spend a few moments doing that in a kind way. I think that's that's it. You, you know, the, that inquiring is is really important, and that those are the kind of things that, as as, as a, a person, not a psychotherapist, they really hit mm. something in me. Is when somebody, you know, w without a reason, is inquiring. Mm. It's quite intimate that that transaction with somebody, and. Don't forget, these clients may, may never have had even a moment of that. Yeah. That's so healing, isn't it? It is, it is. And it it's, it's goes deep and it's long-lasting as well. Yeah, definitely. Many, 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 many students, many, many, many therapists in my travels have said, I just want to do something. And they read all these books and they by definition, have to be taught many different things. But actually, at the end of the day, if they can somehow take on board that just by being in the room, by being kind, by showing compassion, inquire about what may or may not have happened to them, is actually often the most healing thing they can ever do. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it is powerful. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes the most interesting and impactful sessions I've had are when a client has said they don't know what to bring. You know, when you, you say, so what would you like to talk about today? Or what do you want to bring for them? They're like, yeah, well, there, there isn't anything really. And at the end of it, they'll say, wow, I don't even know where that came from because that was not what I was intending on talking about in today's session. Now you see what they're really saying is, you know, I'm okay. I, I can look after myself. Yeah. Now, if a therapist buys into that, I don't do think they're doing their job well enough. No, no. But it, 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 it's interesting to, to peel it back in a session when they've not come with anything specific to talk about. And yeah. it's like, well, let's just, you know, we'll just explore and we'll see what comes up. We'll see what comes up is, is so important. Yeah. So thank you for that, Bob. You're welcome. I've, I've, I've done really well because I've got the next one. Normally, I forget we, what we're going to do. So I think in the next podcast, what we're going to do is looking at the disturbed client. Oh, wow. Wow, wow. That's, that, I, I, that's a great podcast. And what's this? That's fantastic. I mean, it'll, I don't know. I can only talk what I know for half an hour but I could on, I took, probably talk a whole day on that subject so but well, we'll keep it to 30 minutes uh, Bob. Fine, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. so I will see you in the next one which is going to be episode 47 working with the disturbed we're mind. heading to 50 then we're getting there okay yeah. no, I'll speak to you soon yeah take care bye 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 you've been listening to the therapy show Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode. <laughs>